We're just going to adjust the way. Thank you for coming. We have folks here. Okay, we have we have um, attendees here from the United Kingdom, from Sweden, um, from pretty much all four corners of the United States. So I'm so excited to again have the national conference. We, our last one was in 2015, so it's been it's been a few years, and it's high time that we brought us together again. Um, and again, I'm excited that this is the first time that we will be meeting at the same time as the researchers. So our first speaker for the patient conference part of this is Dr. Yashar Kalani. Um, Dr. Kalani is a cerebrovascular neurosurgeon, and he is director of the Angioma Alliance CCM Clinical Center at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the Rhode um, Dr. Kalani's academic credentials include an MS in chemistry and biochemistry from UCLA, an MS and PhD in chemistry from the California Institute of Technology, and an MD and postdoctoral studies at Stanford University School of Medicine, uh, where he was supported by fellowships from the Howard Hughes Medical Institution, the American Medical Association, the American Heart Association, and the SARS Foundation. For those of us who have been around for a while, in 2009, he began his clinical training at the Barrow Neurological Institute under Dr. Robert Spetzler, where he completed his fellowship training in complex spine, cerebrovascular, and skull nerve surgery, and endovascular neurosurgery. His research includes investigating the use of profanol for treatment of CCM, and we hope that eventually this might culminate in a clinical trial, as well as other things. Please welcome him. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, guys. Thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak uh, a little bit about uh, cannabis confirmations uh, to a population who's obviously very, very familiar with much of what I'm going to talk about. So I hope to keep this interactive, and please feel free to stop me uh, with questions uh, as they arise. Uh, as Connie mentioned, I am at the University of Virginia, where I uh, have a, a delightful opportunity to work with a great team of uh, folks from neurology, nursing, rehab, as well as with basic researchers who are interested in finding therapies for patients who are affected by stroke. That's both ischemic stroke, uh, but also the smaller subset of patients affected by hemorrhagic stroke. Nonetheless, the effect is significant on the patient's lives. Uh, Russell did a really great job of talking uh, a lot about backgrounds uh, for cavernous malformations, so I won't dwell much on that, but I'll give just a touch. Uh, and again, uh, you guys are all probably very familiar with a lot of this. But the prevalence of cavernous malformations is 25%. So if you look at studies, 1 in 200 to 1 in 600 patients have a cavernous malformation. Now, naturally, not all of these cavernous malformations are symptomatic, and with the uh, increased use of non-invasive imaging that's being done, we're picking up more and more and more cavernous malformations in patients. And as clinicians, we're left wondering what exactly to do about these incidentally identified, often very small cavernous malformations, and how you know, interacting with the, with the disease process and, and intervening, whether it be with surgery, uh, radiation, or a small molecule-based therapy, how we're going to affect the natural history of this disease and how we're going to affect the patient most important. Men and women seem to be equally affected, and uh, the patients tend to present in the third and fourth decade of life, although you have patients presenting very early on, uh, and you have patients present much later uh, than the third and fourth decade of life. And they are a significant cause of morbidity in, in a young age group. The most common uh, presentation of patients uh, remains seizures, with 40 to 80 percent of them going on uh, to uh, obtain a diagnosis of a CCM, and then a significant portion of those, as Rosa mentioned, going on to develop uh, medically recalcitrant and refractory epilepsy requiring multiple medications on. The second most common presentation of CCMs, and the one that uh, tends to be often the most scary for patients, is hemorrhage. 
And we know that these lesions uh, can hemorrhage, and the hemorrhage may be a minimal consequence, small headache maybe, to uh, a hemorrhage that results in neurologic devastation, uh, death, disability, uh, dependence. And increasingly, we're identifying these lesions incidentally, and as I mentioned, we're left with the dilemma of answering the question of what is the natural history of the treatment versus natural history of the intervention, and of course, the outcome of the intervention. So that's the question of what is the natural history. Now, I'm trying to summarize a very, very large body of literature in one single slide, which is not going to do this justice. But if you look at all CCMs, the risk of bleeding is in somewhere in the order of less than half a percent to around 7% per patient year. If you look at deep cavernous mouth emissions, the risk can be 20 times higher. And when the lesions bleed, they tend to bleed in a repeated uh, fashion uh, and have the patients can have multiple hemorrhages uh, divided over a very small period of time. Uh, the rebleeding rate in brainstem carinomas has been reported to be as low as 5 and as high as 60% over the acute period when the bleed has happened. And about 1 in 5 of the rebleeds can be devastating to the patient. So what if you do nothing? And there are, there are some studies that have followed large numbers of patients for uh, a significant period of time. I would argue 36 months is probably not adequate anymore. This is a study that was published in 1994, but it does give us a glimpse of what conservative uh, tracing of a carinoma in a patient shows. Uh, about half of the patients recover completely after the first bleed. About 20% of the patients are minimally disabled, but then you have this uh, percentage of patients, about 14% who are severely disabled, and then one in five may end up dying from this. Now, we know that in many, many cases, uh, recovery or partial recovery after a bleed is the rule rather than the exception. And we do know that at least in a subset of patients, these dynamic lesions can regress. So here's a patient who presented with uh, posterior fossa symptoms, had the MRI on the left side at T equals zero. This patient elected not to have an operation. And two years later, the MRI revealed that there was really only a small speckle uh, left of where that cavernous mouth patients had left. So at least a subset of them do exhibit quite dynamic uh, <clears throat> relationships and can regress on their own. But what about the ones that don't continue to bleed and require uh, some type of intervention? What are, what are the options that are available? Well, the treatment options, at least as I see them, and I think many would agree with this, are limited to observation, at least currently, and surgery. Observation can result in hemorrhage in anywhere from one-third to two-thirds of these patients. Know. So an observation alone approach is not always advisable for patients. And patients with medically refractory uh, seizures or new episodes of symptomatic coverage from these lesions are sometimes referred for surgery. And this is the subset of patients who, at least at the surgeon's discretion and after discussion with the patient and the family, believe that the risk of surgery is smaller than the risk of waiting for another bleed and the result and consequences of that. So in the patients who we think we can do a good job removing the lesion and removing the likelihood of a repeat episode, we offer that subset of patients an operation hoping to do less harm than the malformation will do. And it turns out that for lesions that are superficial in the brain, that are easily accessible, that come to the surface of the brain, and I'll show you some examples, the surgical results are quite good. Their uh, risk of mortality it's not zero, but it's pretty close to zero. And the risk of transient and permanent morbidities uh, are uh, what most people would consider acceptable. So, you know, in a pooled analysis of the larger surgical trials, surgical studies looking at superficial lesions, the rate of transient morbidity ranges from 7.6 to 21 percent, and long term, this number is 1.3 to 3.2 percent. What I always tell patients is if you're coming to have surgery, expect that you're going to get somewhat worse after surgery because I have to manipulate the brain and the structures that are eloquent that led you to be found to have a cavernous malformation in the first place. But that this transient deficit will over time improve as the swelling subsides 
as the hematoma is removed, and of course, as the blood breakdown products, which are an irritant to the brain. So for, for superficial lesions, this is an acceptable strategy. But the results are a little bit more sobering when you start looking at deep-seated lesions. And for the deep-seated lesions, especially in the brainstem and the thalamus, some in the spinal cord, the results are just not as good. Uh, the rate of new postoperative deficits range between uh, 30 to 46 percent, which is quite high. You're coming in to have a lesion removed, hoping that you're not going to suffer from deficits, yet I will almost invariably give you a new deficit, at least transiently, to be able to remove this lesion and prevent repeated cycles of bleeding. That's really what we're doing when we're offering surgery. We're saying that this thing is going to bleed over and over and over again, and there's going to be a stepwise decline with each bleed. So what the surgeon is asking you is to take, uh, to put all your faith in his or her hands and take all the risk up front to hope that you are stopping these cycles of repeated hemorrhage that result in gradual decline. And that risk is significant. In one third to one half of the patients are going to at least temporarily have to raise them or thalamic surgery be left worse than they were before surgery because, as I'll show in uh, the slides that are coming, you are in high state real estate with really very little margin for error. Uh, but it's really these results, and less so the results of superficial lesions, uh, that remind us that we need something better than surgery. We need something that is going to be uh, safe, effective, durable, and not cost so much on the patients. So, what is the decision to treat based on? Well. First and foremost, based on your guys' desire to have them treated, which is why you come to see the surgeon, to see the neurologist, to see the interventionists. But then other factors weigh heavily into this. What is the natural history of the lesion? And what is the natural history of your lesion? How many bleeds have you had in the recent past? How many bleeds have you had, period, over the course of your lifetime? Where is the lesion? Can I get to it safely? Can I remove it without doing more harm? And do you only have one lesion or do you have multiple? These patients, unfortunately, are a huge treatment challenge for us. How do you know of the plethora of lesions that are on these scans, which one it is that's causing the patient's symptoms, and which one it is that you can remove safely and hope that the one next to it or one distant from it doesn't start bleeding off the site? And then, as I mentioned, the treating team's experience, in this case for a surgical approach, the surgeon's experience weighs heavily. These are lesions that are, by and large, in most of uh, the places around this country rare lesions. So most surgeons see maybe one of these lesions a year, maybe. And these are lesions that are treated by a whole plethora of different lesions. Vascular surgeons treat them, tumor surgeons treat them. The general neurosurgeon who is not used to operating in eloquent areas will treat them. So these are lesions that are <coughs> rare. So you want to go somewhere and get treatment from a team that can give you multidisciplinary care, including great neurology and great great rehab, but also some, uh, a team that has the experience to actually be able to do this safely. <laughs> so I mentioned morbidity. I want to highlight uh, two studies before I go into the rest of my talk. These are two large series that were published uh, from the Baron Neurological Institute, uh, Dr. Spessler's experience, uh, who I had the fortune of training with, and uh, Stanford's experience, uh, Dr. Steinberg's. Uh, and in the barrel experience, out of 137 patients that was published in this report, 53% had new or worsening neurological symptoms. And permanent new deficits in the 93% in the 93 patients who really had long-term follow-up was around 36%. And the perioperative complication in a cohort of 74 uh, uh, patients that had follow-up was 28%. Uh, in the Stanford series, they noted that about 61% of patients improved after surgery in these areas, 24%, uh, 25% were unchanged, and 19 or 11% of the patients fared worse neurologically post operatively Now, these are two very experienced surgeons who cumulatively between the two of them have done a thousand lesions in, in the, the depths of the brain. And in the most experienced of hands, the results are... Um, modest at best. So this reminds us that when it comes to at least these lesions, uh, observation, at least now, when we don't have 
a medical therapy or an effective otherwise therapy available to us should be considered heavily. And only patients who truly, truly exhibit clinical criteria of aggressive lesions should be considered for surgery. And when you are left without options, you then have really only the option of surgery currently available. But are there medical uh, treatments available? And these were touched upon, uh, I know, yesterday, and I'll just very briefly touch upon one that I'm interested in. And this is the literature behind uh, using uh, the non-selective beta blocker for panel. And this really came out of what is now uh, an old paper in 2009 out of a uh, case report in the New England Journal of Medicine. And New England Journal of Medicine doesn't publish case reports. Uh, it doesn't because it really publishes the highest body of literature that we have available for this in the medical field. And this was a case of a child who had a facial hemangioma of an infancy and who had uh, this lesion on the top left hand was treated with uh, those of two to three mix per kick of propranolol. And it resulted in this really robust response to this medication. And prior to this medication being available or used in this population, the standard of care for these kids was to use high dose steroids to treat them. And you can imagine high dose steroids in a child whose entire body is undergoing rapid development is probably not the best treatment option. So it left these children with significant amount of complications long term. Um, but what's what is not known, and although there is some hints of mechanism coming from studies in hemangiomas, also studies in other vascular tumors, mostly hemangioblastomas actually from the NIH, uh, we think that the mechanism is either vasoconstriction, uh, modulation of VEGF, uh, triggering apoptosis, or really suppressing proliferation or migration of endothelial cells. The mechanism is really not known. And this is you know, a chart highlighting potentially all the different places where propranolol may modify biology of CCM. But by and large, we don't know much about this mechanism. Uh, we know that capillary hemangiomas have common genetic background with CCMs, and that a subset of patients at least have uh, hemangiomas and CCMs in the same uh, patient. When it comes to propranolol, there are some things that make it uh, a good drug. Uh, first of all, it's got 50 years of uh, 50 year of history use in adults. Uh, it's greater than 40 uh, years of clinical use in children. And in this large randomized controlled trial that was published on the children with facial hemangiomas, the adverse side effects were really fairly well tolerated in children. Although when you start treating adults with propranolol, you come to a very, very quick realization that all the children seem to tolerate it Adults seem to hate it. And invariably, all of the adults who I've started this medication on at some point complain of the severe side effects, which include things like bradycardia, hypertension, uh, hypoglycemia, breathing problems, erectile dysfunction. Uh, really, uh, things that affect the quality of life. And the reason for that is that this medication <coughs> is very, very dirty. It hits many, many different receptors in your body. It modulates a lot of different functions. So the side effect profile often makes it unfavorable. So this means that if propranolol really does work, and I'll be the first to admit we don't really know in a prospective fashion that it works. The problem with anecdotal medicine is that the placebo effect and the power of wanting something to work is a powerful thing. And you start putting patients on it without doing it in a diligent, randomized, prospective fashion, as Rosalind mentioned, you're setting yourself up for failure. But at least in the patient hemangioma of infancy, they did the gold standard and they published this now uh, large study that was uh, performed on infants between one to five months of age. Uh, and uh, they were randomized to receiving oral propranolol at a dose of one to three milligram per kilogram. Uh, versus placebo. And they showed that in this subset that there is a robust response to the ch uh, in children who had the propranolol treatment. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, there is a problem, and that is that this drug is uh, promiscuous, that it functions in a lot of different areas, and that we, if it works, we need to figure out how it works, something that my lab is working on currently using mouse models. Uh, also, we need to understand how to pick a drug that is cleaner less side effects for the patients and more tolerable. Uh, one of the things that does make propranolol really an ideal drug is it's one of the few drugs that can uh, uh, get to where it needs to do its job and its biology is favorable for this disease. 
medications, so maybe there's something to work here. But there are other medications, statins that Dr. Awad mentioned, Tempol, which is out of work uh, from Dr. Kevin Whitehead and the Dean Lee's group at University of Utah, uh, vitamin D, rokinase inhibitors you've heard about. So there are a plethora of other options that are being investigated for this disease. And hopefully one or multiple of these medications will make it so that uh, a surgeon never has to see another patient and treat this disease surgically. Uh, a word of caution on radio surgery, and Rosa mentioned this, uh, and this was an editorial that uh, we published with uh, Dr. Lawton and Dr. Spessler. It's coming out in the uh, recent issue of Journal of Neurosurgery. There were two large uh, studies published from the United Kingdom on use of radio surgery for patients with thyroid illness. And if you look diligently and carefully at the data, the data is worrisome. Uh, and it's worrisome because some basic tenets of uh, the biology of these people were not taken into consideration, and the results are really not as good as, as advertised in these papers. And it is at least the opinion of a large number of providers that this should be reserved and not used as first-line treatment for patients with diabetes. So surgery, I've been invited to talk about the surgical uh, management of some of these things. So I'm going to go through and use some cases to illustrate when surgery is possible, when it can be done safely, and what the patient's outcomes can be. Certainly for every good case that a surgeon can show you, he or she has in uh, the depths of their heart cases that have not gone well and that they've learned many, many things about. So uh, I think, again, patient selection is the cornerstone of having good outcomes. Uh, we've had some tools that have become available that have allowed us to tackle lesions that are not on the surface of the brain, that are at the depths of crevices, and that have allowed us to get to them safely without disturbing the brain. These are instruments like lighted suckers and bipolars, which magnify and illuminate the depth of uh, the surgical field. Single shafted instruments that allow you to go at a depth of 10, 12 centimeters into the middle of the skull. And the marriage of uh, magnification and illumination from the microscope with neuro navigation, which is the GPS for the brain, that allow us to find tiny, tiny lesions that are hiding within the brainstem, which is the size of your thumb and carries everything that's near and dear to you up and down from your brain to your spinal cord. And the question was asked at the during breakfast, why is it so hard to repair, you know, not just the brain, but the spinal cord? Well, the brain, we know the challenges and we've all heard them. This is in the popular press, the brain doesn't regenerate itself at an appreciable rate. We don't know how to control the stem cells that exist in the brain and get them to help recovery post-stroke or post-injury. But with the brainstem, there's one additional layer of complexity, and that is that everything is essentially cables going up and down through something the size of your thumb. So even simple manipulation of this structure can leave the patient devastated, whether that be at the hands of the surgeon or the hands of the disease. We've also developed some new techniques. We're able to operate on the brain without the use of fixed retractors, and fixed retractors, although they allowed us to move the brain out of the way to get to deep lesions, they caused harm to the brain, it caused strokes, and now we're uh, moved away from using these tools, and the surgeon has additional tools available to him or her in the operating room to be able to do the job. There are also operative adjuncts, so when a patient is placed on the operating room table, there's a team of dedicated neurologists who are continuously monitoring physiologic functions as we're operating on patients using EEG, and invoke potential monitoring. There is a dedicated anesthesiologist and an anesthesia team that is responsible for putting the patient <laughs> to sleep, maintain, maintaining the patient's blood pressure and physiologic functions under control. And of course, uh, the operating room staff that allow us to be able to do our job. So keys of a successful operation and procedure is all about planning, picking the right patient, but then when you have the patient ultimately pick for surgery, being able to position the patient, being able to approach the lesion using craniotomies that allow you to get to the lesion without causing harm to the patient, and using approaches that allow you to get into areas like the brainstem without leaving a huge footprint. Okay. So I mentioned brainstem is the size of your thumb. There are tracks going up and down. There are areas in the brainstem which can be traversed with uh, relatively low morbidity to the patient. For lesions, cavernomas that come to the surface of the brain, 
the decision is pretty easy. It's already done the job and it's come to the surface, and the surgeon can go directly to the lesion and resect them. For lesions that are at the depth of the brain, though, you have to make a decision of how to access the lesion without going through some of these tracks. And one of the tools that has become available to us is uh, after you know extensive anatomic studies, is this concept of a safe entry, safe entry so, zones to the brain stem. So we're gonna mute this that I hear my voice instead. You'll hear my voice out here. There are areas of the brain stem. I mentioned the, there are the brain stem is composed of ascending and descending, essentially columns of fibers going up and down, where you can enter the brain stem with minimally injuring these fibers. The issue is, however, that the terminus malformation or the other disease in the brainstem can push these pathways out of the way and distort them so that they're not where you would expect them to be under normal circumstances. Nonetheless, the imaging technology that has become available has now allowed us to be able to tackle at least a subset of these that are located in the brain. Apologize, pointer, let me a little bit of a ride. See if this will work again. Uh, doesn't want to. That's okay. We'll we'll go on with we'll go on with some examples of cases and I'll illustrate this. This is a this is a patient that I did when I was at the University of Utah. Uh, a gentleman who arrived uh, to clinical attention, 52 years old. He would had two bleeds attributable to this lesion, and these bleeds were one week separated from each other in time. Uh, after he had his first bleed, the surgeon who first evaluated him said, "There's nothing to do." This is not really an approachable lesion. And he was right. This is a lesion that's located in between your midbrain and your pons. But by the time the second bleed had occurred, the lesion had come to a surface that you could get to safely. So this was approached surgically. Uh, and what I ended up doing is I, uh, I elected to operate on this patient in order to prevent another episode of a bleed that would leave him further devastated and injured. He was actually in fairly decent neurological shape at this point, despite his two bleeds. So linear incision here on the side of the head, and what you do is you use uh, surgical instruments to remove the bone, allowing you to come to the surface. Now this lesion is deep, so what you have to do is you have to find the corridor which you can take the least invasive path past all the brain structures to actually get to the cavernoma. And you're going to see here, this is the surface of the brain stem coming into view, and that's the fourth cranial nerve which controls eye movement. Some of the patients who had bleeds, that nerve may stop functioning and you may not be able to use your eye efficiently. Here we're coming to the side of the brainstem. And again, for lesions that come to the surface, what you end up seeing is a bronze or a slightly red tinged surface of the brain. But sometimes the lesion doesn't make it all the way to the surface. And in this case, it hadn't made it all the way to the surface, even though the imaging suggested that it had. But what we're able to use is the neuro navigation system, which is the GPS for the brain, to find the ideal point of entry to minimally disturb those fibers. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm spreading the uh, fibers of the brain stem in line with those ascending and descending fibers, hoping to minimize the manipulation and injury to those fibers. Then when you get into the cavernoma, what you end up finding is blood products of various stages of resolution. Because what ends up happening after a bleed is the brain tries to repair itself and clear the blood in the blood breakdown products. After removing that, you end up finding these caverns, these classic mulberry-like appearance of these lesions, which everybody talks about. And they're essentially, uh, I liken them to small little gravelets that are filled with blood. And when they're not filled with blood, they actually appear white and they glisten at the base of the cavity. And one of the mistakes that's sometimes made during removal of these lesions is those small glistening white flakes are not removed. Those are actually live caverns that don't have blood in them. And if you don't remove those at the end of the operation, what can happen is that they can fill with blood again and rupture once more and you have the hemorrhages from the cavity. Uh, it was mentioned by Rustam and others that these lesions come from Developmental venous anomalies, at least in a subset of cases. These developmental venous anomalies are remnants of embryonic circulation that have persisted into adulthood. And you can actually find that the cavernomas butt off of the side of these. And it's important to preserve those because if you don't, you can actually give the patient a stroke during this process. So you can see very long depth 
uh, 12 centimeters to get into the uh, brainstem. And essentially what I'm doing is I am healing the cavernoma of the brainstem. I'm not touching the brainstem itself, I'm rather grabbing the lesion and peeling it away from the structures and removing it piecemeal. Each one of the lesions that's removed here is one of those small grapes or one of those small components of the mulberry. And this really shows you the depth of the open. And this is the repair. Can you guys see me okay? I apologize, my back is good. And postoperatively, the patient did have a new partial third nerve palsy. And that is an example of one of those deficits that invariably you end up giving the patient because of manipulation of really, really eloquent structures in a very, very small area. The thing I have is picture, you can see here his left eye and the subtle, the subtle drift that he had had, that's how he uh, presented it. But uh, even, even after careful approach, they can certainly have at least some transient post-operative deficits. I mentioned this approach, uh, the ability to get into the brain and manipulate structures without invading and traversing a lot of eloquent brain has been made possible because we can now remove bone in areas of the brain at the base of the skull to create room to get past critical structures. And this advent of skull-based approaches is something that's happened over the past 30 years with contributions from a lot of really great surgeons working both in the United States and uh, around the world have made it possible for us to make small openings at the base of the skull where a lot of really critical anatomy comes together and then be able to really sneak by the cerebellum, sneak by other critical structures to be able to gain access to the brainstem and the cranial nerves and really function and operate here in this area. So this was this was the approach that was used for, uh, for the last lesion that I showed you guys. So show you another case. This was an older gentleman who had come after three repeated hemorrhages over uh, one year. He was 72, he usually had a pause precaution in operating on somebody this old. But this gentleman had three hemorrhages over one year, and each hemorrhage had resulted in him significantly declining to the point where he was essentially hospice bound, and he had lost about 30 pounds of weight. His wife was no longer able to care for him. So uh, he had diminished hearing on the right, he had dysmetria, so I took him to the operating room again using a very similar approach to try and remove this lesion, hoping to stop the repeated cycles of hemorrhage. Again, large openings that were a, a thing of the past are no longer necessary for removing the balcones. This was done through a three centimeters incision. Craniotomy is about two centimeters, so we're using cleaner, smaller approaches, using keyhole surgery to arrive at these lesions. And here you see the light of suction being used and you can see uh, that it allows illumination at the depth, something that would have been very difficult to adequately illuminate with just the microscope. And it's these tools that now allow us to get to these lesions safely and do a better job of removing them without injuring the adjacent structures. So here the cerebellum is pushed out of the way, and this is that same view that you saw in the animation. The sinus is mobilized and pushed away, and now I'm dissecting the arachnoid here. This is the white band over the cranial nerves to get to the side of the brainstem and the cerebellum where this lesion is located. And it'll come to you and you'll see the classic appearance, the discoloration that the repeated cycles of hemorrhage have left on the brain. Everybody okay with surgical videos, right? <laughs> I, I, I say, I'll tell you guys a good story of why I asked this after I show this video. It's actually a little disturbing. It's amazing. So here, the lower cranial nerves that control swallowing are in the bottom corner of your screen. And again, I'm just detaching the structures here to be able to push the cerebellum out of the way to get a good circumferential view of the malformation. And here the malformation comes into view. And you can see the stained area of the brain here. And care must be taken whenever possible. This is not the same for superficial lesions, but for deep lesions, care must be taken to stop resection right at the edge where the cavernous malformation is separate from the brain. Because every little bit of hemosiderin stained brain that you take in critical areas like the brain stem or in the thalamus, the patient's gonna have more deficits when they wake up without really gaining any benefit from the removal. And here again, care is taken to peel the malformation off the brainstem. 
you can see they're not terribly vascular. These are, these are venous diseases. They're not very vascular, but they're just vascular enough to cause trouble. And when they bleed, they cause tiny little strokes. But the cumulative effect of these strokes is what devastates patients. And really, the best analogy I've heard, and I heard this from uh, Dr. Joseph Ramsky, who's not here with us today, but usually attends this meeting, these are hemorrhoids of the brain. And they are small venous hemorrhoids. And when they bleed, despite their relatively benign appearance, can cause major problems for patients, as you, as you guys all probably well know. And here, the malformation is lifted off. And finally dissected in the room. Each of these, again, are those small caverns. There, finally, is mobilized and being pulled out. So this gentleman actually ended up fairly very well. His lesion was removed, his cycles of hemorrhage arrested, and he slowly began gaining weight in over the past year that I followed him from afar. He's actually done quite well. He's living at home with his wife. But you know, this is an example of the repeated cycles of hemorrhage devastating a patient and leading to gradual decline. Here are final steps of stopping all the little bleeding and the closure. Again, you can see the opening here is only about two centimeters. We can do these now through these smaller, cleaner approaches and really get the patient home uh, in a fairly small period of time. And here's the postdoctoral reception. So before I show the, the next two cases, I, I, I tell you a good story. I, I was asked to give a talk on uh, hemorrhagic uh, vascular malformations to a group of pediatricians. So you think they're all doctors, they've all seen all of this. And I started by showing one of the surgical videos and I said the most common presentation of cameras malformation is a seizure. And as I turned to the audience, there was a girl seizing in her chair oh from the side of the butt. So now I sort of learned to ask people if they can, if they're okay with showing some of these videos. Uh, this is a case we did recently. This is a gentleman who came to us uh, with uh, familial play. I'll play for you. I apologize. I'm not sure. Why is it not working? Gap in my video is not playing this game. It's okay. I have to use <laughs> you guys see? Um, it's not doing it. Sorry about that. This is a this is a patient that we did uh, recently at the University of Virginia. This gentleman has familial form of the disease. He's 52. He has three prior bleeds attributable to this lesion that had left him with fairly significant swallowing difficulties, and uh, he was noted to have this lesion in the medulla grow uh, with evidence of uh, of hemorrhage recently when he presented to me. So. We ended up removing this lesion because of his repeated cycles of hemorrhage. And again, this person has three hemorrhages. So you want to pick your patient carefully to get the most optimal results. But when you do ultimately decide to remove the lesion, you want to leave the smallest footprint that's possible in removing these lesions. So this lesion was located at the floor of the fourth ventricle, really critical area. A lot of the fibers controlling breathing, 
phonation all past there. So you can really leave the patient in worse off shape if you're not careful and diligent about it. And here you're going to get a, a glimpse of uh, the cavity and what it looks like when you open up. So brainstem at the depth, these are the leaves of the cerebellum and I lift the cerebellum up. And as I lift the cerebellum up, the first thing that comes to attention is this yellow hue and tint at the base of the fourth ventricle. And again, this area is very, very critical. So what you don't want to do is enter this area without giving consideration to the structures that you're damaging with your entry alone. So put a cotton ball so blood doesn't pool inside the brain. And then this is a dye that I use in surgery to try and help me see whether the lesion comes to the surface. And I use the stimulator to try and stimulate where the critical cranial nerve nuclei are that then uh, could potentially be injured. And I try to pick an area where there is no stimulation in this and enter it there. So I find an area where there is no stimulation, it's safe to enter. And you see I'm spreading the fibers parallel in line with the, with the way that they pass and then opening up to get into this cavernous malformation. And the opening that's made is the size of the tip of my sucker. And the tip of my sucker is about one and a half millimeters. So the openings are tiny. They're magnified with the microscope. They look much bigger, but they are tiny. Here is another one of those tools that I mentioned has been developed. These fine, fine instruments with sharp tips at the end, which allow me to grab the cavernous malformation and just tweeze it away. They're essentially small tweezers to ease it away from adjacent brainstem structures. And here you see one of the examples of the caverns at the depth of the cavity. This is the cavern that's filled with blood. There are other caverns in this resection cavity that don't have any blood in them. So they're all essentially white flakes that are lining this bed here. And what we do is diligently try to peel them off one at a time, one flake at a time off the brainstem without migrating out into the brainstem <laughs> part of the patient. And here you see I pulled one of them out and I got this flow of blood. This was some of the blood from the recent hemorrhage that had been uh, essentially trapped and pulled amongst the caverns. And again, with the use of the navigation system, which keeps me honest, which reminds me that I'm getting past the boundary of the cavernous malformation, I slowly, slowly peel every one of these flakes off the beads, uh, off the brain stem here. For those of you interested in anatomy, this lesion was located at a place called Thomas Scriptorius, which again is uh, high state real state. So if you develop postoperative deficits after an operation, this is the reason. Very, very small, very small area. Low the hemostatic to stop the oozing. Remember, these are venous, so you don't need to use a lot of cautery to burn everything. Actually, cautery can hurt. So put a little bit of hemostatic to stop the oozing. And then just inspect the cavity to make sure that the tiny little caverns are not left behind. And here's the final view. And here's the resection showing that the lesion was removed, but the hemocytorin stained brain was not. Because in this case, if you remove the hemocytorin staining, you would leave this patient completely devastated. And one more, one more final case of again another uh, recent patient who came. Uh, to clinical attention with us. Uh, this patient, highly functioning uh, young woman who worked uh, as a legal assistant in the law firm, had sudden onset uh, symptoms, October 2017. Uh, and she did have some residual symptoms by the time she came to see us. Her left leg was numb, she had discoordination, was noted to have uh, multiple lesions. The one that had caused the trouble though was this one sitting in the base ganglia insula area. And uh, what's Actually, favorable about this lesion is that there is a corridor where I can get to this lesion without touching any of the basal ganglia or the insular structures. And that's what we ended up doing. We took her to the operating room and used one of these minimally invasive small corridors, splitting the fibers of the brain out of the way to get to this deep structure, which is the, uh, which is the insula. And you can see from this dissection that a lot of critical fibers controlling motor vision are going to be passing around this area. So... What you have to do is minimize your footprint as a surgeon in getting there. And one of the ways you can minimize your footprint is by actually separating the pieces of the brain from each other and dissecting them from each other without actually cutting across those fibers. And that's what I'm doing here, is I'm opening one of these leaflets between the two uh, uh, gyri in the brain. This is called the sulcus. So I'm opening up the sulcus to create a corridor 
or I'm not going to actually uh, injure uh, brain function in this area to get down into and identify the cavernous malformation. Again, the neural navigation, the GPS of the brain is key to being able to do this. We couldn't do this before this technology became available. Because then to do this, you would have to go through a ton of critical structures. Peeling away until we arrive at what the navigation is telling me is the correct area to enter. Okay? There's no hemosiderin staining, so I can't tell without that. But I can tell from the navigation that right where I am, underneath my hand, is the cavernoma. So I use a small set of forceps again, make a small, small opening, and get into what is the cavernoma. It will come into view shortly here. And there it is. That opening is expanded, and there is the hemocytic staining now, and there is the cavernoma. And you're actually going to see here some examples of nice collapsed caverns, which just look glistening white. They're beautiful. Here's the cavernoma, again, being peeled away from the basal ganglia structures. Again, we remove these piecemeal. On the surface of the brain, we remove them as one piece. Easier to do that there because there's more room and you can actually take a little bit of a margin of that stained brain. Again, in the basal ganglia, you cannot take that hemocytrin stained brain. If you take it, the patient is gonna wake up with deficits. So here, what I'm doing is I'm using the uh, sucker to really peel the cavernoma. Here's the white glistening that you see. See that? That is a cavern that is not filled with blood. It's collapsed, but that is live cavernoma. And often one of the reasons why we have post-operative hemorrhages, surgeons do not remove every one of these small caverns that are collapsed. And what I'm doing is I'm peeling gently the structure away from normal brain. And then once it's free and mobilized, uh, it's cut sharply and removed. And once the large piece is removed again, the depth of it is inspected, and you get the stasis by using the combination of pottery and with using some of the hemostatic agents that we have to do with this. Again, postoperatively, she did great. This is the scan showing that with the help of the navigation, we were able to stop just at the edge of the basal ganglia structures. A couple of millimeters the other way and she would have uh, not been able to move. And these are really, again, made possible only with the advent of these tools that allow us to uh, get there safely and remove these safely. These two videos I showed you. So just a couple of concluding remarks. Uh, in well-selected patients, surgery can be performed safely. And this is both true for superficial lesions where the morbidity is fairly small and for deep lesions if they can be gotten to safely without disturbing the critical structures that surround these lesions. Uh, there are medical options on the horizon and I think that's why it's important to come to these meetings where uh, people who are affected by the disease can interact and talk to and collaborate with uh, the physicians, the researchers, the administrators, the funding bodies. And uh, really the progress that's been made possible in this field has been because of these collaborations. Uh, in my opinion, and in the opinion I think of a large number of people who are practicing in this area, radiosurgery is not recommended for treatment of these lesions, at least for the majority of these lesions. And the decision to intervene on a patient is certainly made, uh, taken into consideration the patient's wishes and preference, natural history of the data, uh, natural history data available, 
not only for cavernomas, but for the patient's cavernomas, and also the multiplicity of the lesion and uh, one's experience in the uh, I'm fortunate at the University of Virginia to have a phenomenal team uh, who has uh, come together to uh, start a center. Uh, Dr. Min Park is my neurosurgical partner. Dr. Peter Tverdi is a, a phenomenal research scientist, uh, assistant professor who works in the Department of Neurosurgery, is dedicated to seeing the portion of his effort to studying cavernoma biology. Uh, Ms. Rannigan is a nurse practitioner and also clinical coordinator for our center. She makes sure that patients are able to get uh, multidisciplinary care that they deserve for this disease process. And we have our team of neurologists in the uh, bottom panels at Brad Oral, Andy Sutherland, uh, Pedro Norat, and uh, Brett, who we were uh, able to recruit from New Mexico, one of the few dermatologists in the country who was interested in the study of the disease process. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with you guys and continue to do the good advocating that you do because that is really the way to get some uh, improvements uh, for patients with Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, um, I'm going to tell you from the urologist, I was speaking next, but one of the things that I see sometimes with patients is that the post-op MRI, the radiologist will say, well, can you use it? Well, maybe not. And what is the best indication? Is it MRI or is it a knee in the operation? So, that's a, that's a great question. I One of the requests I have about training is that I didn't use Robert's Factor Series to answer that question. Because he obtained MRIs on every single patient who Postoperatively, and invariably, every single report says hematoma within the cavity, maybe residual, but the correlate clinically, right? The, the issue is that's a question that I think, as a field, we can answer by pooling some of our MRI results and looking at what percentage of the patients who had these uh, hematoma residuals and they're having a rebleed, and whether, you know, if you put the retrospective scope on it, you'll create the um, I would say that although I uh, feel fairly confident most of the time that I removed every single region. I cannot tell 100% whether there was one of those small caverns that was covered by a small amount of hemocytic stain brain and I just left it behind. And that's what I'm seeing on the scanner now. Uh, superficial lesions where you can get to a margin, much easier. I think you can have a good degree of confidence that you've done your job completely because you are removing some of that hemocytic stain brain. Thalus in the brain stem where you cannot do that. I don't think you can say with confidence. And I would argue that an MRI obtained in the medical stop is probably useless. Uh, and that, that scan should be delayed two weeks to you know, six weeks where some of that hematoma is resolved and then you can actually look and say whether uh, there's something left there or not. But I think that's a question that could be addressed if we pooled our uh, scans across several institutions. Yes. 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 I have my patient, so excuse my ignorance if I don't know how to no, no. ask the question. So the cavernomas have a uh, where they're fed from, where the source of the bleed is. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hear you speak anything about of the source, actually really the cavernoma itself. So mm -hmm. whether it's a feeding vein or what have you, mm -hmm. what becomes of that in my in my sure. formulating question? It, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely formulating correctly. In cases where there is that developmental venous anomaly, where we actually see the cavernoma butt from the side of it, what we do is we preserve the parent vessel and we coagulate where it is butted off. Uh, yes, the likelihood of occurrence is smaller if you resect that DDA, but the likelihood of a postoperative stroke is much higher if you resect that Okay. In cases where there's no obvious DDA uh, identified, we do see at the base of the lesion small venous tributaries going into it, and we coagulate and cut those when we don't chase them. So, yes, sir. What's, what's your opinion on the laser surgery versus by hand? And they should do it by hand. Yeah. So, uh, laser is just a tool. So, CO2 laser we have used for removing some of the deep seated uh, lesions. Uh, but uh, we've moved away from using that. There are certain centers that continue to do it. Gary Steinberg continues to use it at Stanford. It's a good tool. Uh, if you we are past the margin, uh, the tool can really injure tissue. Whereas with the bipolar and the artery, uh, you're less likely to have a little more control over it. But an experienced hand is a great tool. Yes, ma'am. So I have a question on on imaging and 
um, how often do you think that um, a patient with multiple angiomas should get an MRI? Mm -hmm. And um, and also on CT, because I was reading um, recently that the CT scan can actually um, expose to that increase your risk of, of more lesions. Yeah. And I mean, and then in the question, not only like how often should you be checked with an MRI, but um, for me as a patient, which I think you were involved in my surgery with Dr. Spetzler, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> Why you look good? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, is that, do you run to get an MRI every time you feel really symptomatic? I mean, I struggle with that. So, um, so I think Kelly's going to touch on some of this, right? For you know, for um, Okay. Well, I mean, I, I will. I, I'll answer it now. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, CT scans, uh, I have shied away from using unless I'm worried about immediate postoperative hemorrhage after right resect lesion that I want to check to see if there's a new hemorrhage in the cavity. I follow patients with MR scans, non-invasive. The quality is not need to be so good that uh, even small bleeds can be picked up based on some of the sequences that are available. Uh, the uh, timing and uh, repetition of the scans is something that is still not uniform across, and different uh, practitioners order scans at different frequencies. So, on a patient who comes to me with a new diagnosis of a cameras malformation that I'm not going to operate on, I get the for baseline scan, but I make sure the scan fits the criteria that has been established as the correct sequences, the SWE GRE, and I then follow that patient with another scan in one year's time, unless they have a symptomatic hemorrhage. And you know, patients have different uh, sensitivities to uh, new symptoms, right? Some people get a headache and they call the office and say, I think I've had a bleed, you order an MRI scan. Others are, you know, devastated, have weakness, have numbness, they've been laying in the bed for two weeks. Finally, their husband or wife calls saying, hey, my you know, significant other's not doing well, can you order a scan and then we find so I think there is uh, there is some variability in terms of how often patients are scanned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalani. Um, I remember those days so much. So. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yeah. Thank you again. That was that. That was a great presentation. Um, I'm going to be pitching for Connie for the next few hours. Uh, for those of you who have not met. My name is Tony Mayer. I'm the chairman of the board of directors for the Angioma Alliance. Um, yeah. I my path with the Angioma Alliance started about five years ago. I have a son, wife, and my mother law infected. They are infected with the CCM1. So that's how I'm here today. And I'm looking forward to talking with all of you on break. And uh, you can listen to that. Um, a couple housekeeping items before we kick it over to our next uh, presenter. Um, during break, we'll have raffle uh, items. We're giving away a $100 Amazon gift card. Seek help, uh, Stephanie, and myself, or any of those board members to purchase raffle tickets. Um, we also have NGM Alliance items for sale, like shirts, hats, and stuff like that. And then we'll be doing a photo booth up by the main room where we're at this morning, where you can write like, a little inspirational message and have like a frame for it that we'll put on the Facebook page. So um, feel free to use those at any break or lunchtime. Um, and we will put uh, those on the website after, the, um, after we have our um, lunch. So, I'm sorry, after our meeting concludes, so excuse me. So, kick it over to our next uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Kelly Fleming, is a neurologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She's a uh, director of the NGM Alliance Recognized Center, CCM Center of Excellence, and a longtime standing member of the NGM Alliance Scientific Advisory Board. In addition to her clinical responsibilities, Dr. Fleming runs a research project dedicated to investigating the natural history of CCM illness and the leads the follow-up and clinical hypothesis uh, core of the trial writings project that Amy Akers will discuss later this afternoon. Dr. Fleming's research aims to better understand the long-term behavior of CCM lesions and how these affect our lives. This type of research helps to inform both clinical decision-making and clinical trial design. Today, Dr. Fleming will be discussing the important topic of cavernous angioma core morbid uh, morbidities. Please welcome her. Thank you. Um, I don't know why I'm not a 
don't like blood. That's hard. But a lot of times I see patients um, with one of my colleagues in neurosurgery, Dr. Lanzino, and he answers that question that everyone wants to know, which is, do I need surgery or not? And then the patients will see me, and we talk about if observations recommended, what can they expect in terms of if we do nothing, what's the risk of bleeding? And then patients often bring out a notebook of pages of questions. And I like I like them, but at first when I started, it was hard because a lot of those questions had no answers. If I went to the medical literature, there were no answers to those questions. And so I kind of got frustrated about that and felt bad in the position that I couldn't help people. And so that's really your questions that have led to some of the things, the clinical interests I have in um, looking for your answers in our data and to the patients that we see. And I didn't need to scare anyone with the word comorbidity. Morbid sounds like I'm going to talk about all the things. So what I really want to talk about is, is Everyone with cavity small formations has other things going on in their life. They may have headaches, they may have pregnancies, they may need to be on other medications. And the question always is, well, can I be on this medication when I have a uh, cavity small formation? Or what is the risk of pregnancy for me? And so a lot of those common things that happen to everybody, um, we needed more data on. So I'm going to talk about... Um, all of those topics. I'm going to tell you where some of the data is from our registry. So patients that see us um, from 2014 to present, we collected data on patients where we talked to them, well, um, give them a, a survey, they answer the questionnaire, and then annually or semi-annually they'll get another survey asking about um, what medications are you on, what other medical problems do you have, um, has anything new happened in the last year? What kind of physical activity do you do? And so we look at that data and try to match it with what happens to the, the cavernous malformation. Like which of those which of those things correlate with bleeding? Which of those things correlate with um, seizures? And some of the data I'll present is on the first 195, and now we're up to about 232 patients. The majority are sporadic in our area, so about 80% of our um, Patient population is, is sporadic form and 20% familial. Um, many of the familial are not genotyped, but the uh, CCM population is a fair amount of folks in the older region. Um, again, particularly I'm interested in medications, um, other, other comorbidities, just meaning other medical problems and lifestyle factors. Uh, some of the other data I'll present is just expert opinion. Um, as you know, again, some of the medical literature is very um, sparse. And so I took an expert poll asking a couple of the people on the Angel Alliance um, uh, Scientific Advisory Board that were clinicians and some of my colleagues at Mayo Clinic and asked them some questions. And so I'll present some of that data. The first thing I wanted to talk about is headaches. Um, and headaches are common. All of us, nearly all of us, will experience a headache in our lifetime. And some of us will have headaches. 5% uh, of people will have headaches every single day. Um, in my brain, it's about 12 to 15% of the general population, about 25% of women ages 35 to 49 will have migraine as well. And when we look at headaches, we divide it into those that are primary headaches and secondary headaches. Secondary headaches means I see something abnormal on the scan, and I'm trying, uh, and that's causing the headache. Primary headache. Is usually due to a chemical imbalance in the brain. You can't see it on a scan. And so we, we tend to, as neurologists, divide them into those different categories. We all worry about a secondary cause, but 90% of headaches will fit into the migraine cluster tension kind of categories. So why do patients with cavernous malformations get headaches? And a number of folks will get the secondary headache. They have a Bleeding in the brain causes pressure on the brain. Maybe they get hypocephalus, which is where the system that controls the spinal fluid drainage gets backed up and you get excessive um, spinal fluid on the brain. And sometimes it's post-surgical. So those would be secondary type of headaches. 
Um, but it's not uncommon that patients with cavernous malformation get migraines at a frequency that's higher than the general population. And I don't know that we know all of the reasons why that <coughs> is, but it's um, the prevalence is higher than we would expect. So how do we approach these type of headaches? Well, typically with a secondary headache, we identify the cause, get a scan, identify the cause, and often it might be a surgical treatment. If it's a primary headache, we try to categorize it. And there's um, something called the ICHD criteria that there's specific criteria for all the different primary headache types. And we try to put it into a category. And then we talk about what can I do for the headache today? What medications or strategies could I use to prevent the headache today? And then we talk about preventative therapy, which are things that you do every single day to try to reduce the frequency and severity of headaches. And so I, I won't talk about secondary headaches so much, but kind of try to focus on the primary headache disorders. And a lot of times, and you all uh, you have probably experienced a headache, that you often go to the over-the-counter meds first, um, Tylenol, ibuprofen, Aleve, and then Midrin and Triptans are medications often used for migraine-specific type headaches. And then there's some blocks that can be done. Now, it's, it's largely unknown what is the safety of these medications in patients with cavernous malformation? And I hear patients get told all sorts of things of you can't be on ibuprofen, you can't take the triptans, you can't do any of that. And so it really limits what you can do. And the concern with non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or ibuprofen type drugs is that some people are concerned it may cause bleeding. And the concern with triptan medications, and you might have heard of Imitrex, Zomig, those type of medications are that in some people they cause vasospasm, so the blood vessels kind of spasm down. But typically we're worried more about triptans affecting the arteries rather than the capillaries and veins. Um, and we've looked at our data and have not seen any um, increased risk of bleeding in patients on the triptans. Um, we haven't seen that either with the NSAIDs, but the NSAIDs are hard because people take them for a few days, then they stop, and then they take them again. So that one's a hard, hard one to look at. But most of the clinicians I surveyed on that expert poll were okay with both triptans and NSAIDs if the patient hasn't bled recently. So if you had a bleed in the last three months, maybe you'd probably avoid ibuprofen, leave and those sort of things. If, if you're asymptomatic or you're several months out um, from a bleed, then, then those are probably um, safe. So again, uh, if, if you have headaches and we encourage you to talk to your individual doctor about your individual situation. But in general, those medications are often restricted by other colleagues and maybe don't need to be that restricted in patients with different small conditions. If somebody's having more than four headaches a month or they're missing work, missing school because of headaches, then we talk about preventative therapy. What can we do every single day to prevent, um, reduce the frequency, reduce the severity, reduce the duration of headaches? And there are a number of options. There are some are oral medications, some are injectable medications, and some are devices. And I'll just briefly mention these. So there are, specifically for migraine, um, there are cardiovascular medications, uh, antidepressants, anti-seizure medications. And so you can imagine if a patient has headache disorder plus a cavernous malformation, beta blocker, phenylol is in, um, is one of the choices that might be a, an attractive choice. Or if somebody had a seizure disorder, plus a cavernous malformation and headaches, maybe one of the anti-seizure medications would be an optimal choice. I'm not concerned, any of these medications, I'm not concerned that there's some um, safety problem with these and cavernous malformations like causing bleeding. So these are all fairly safe, but they all have side effects, um, some of which are cognitive related in the antidepressant medications and anti-seizure medications. So the other options then become, sometimes we do injectable medications you may have heard of Botox for cosmetic reasons. You know, people get the ghost taken away, but it's also used for chronic migraine. People having more than 15 days of headache per month. In some patients that don't tolerate those preventative oral medications um, or, or just choose this as an option, it, it does reduce the frequency and severity of headache probably about one to three days per month, which, you know, for some people that they may have six a month and it reduces it to two or three. The downside is you have to injections into to about 20 different muscles of the forehead and back here, so some people are not fond of needles. Um, and then a lot of people need re-injections every three months. But this is a very safe op op 
option without any systemic side effects uh, from oral medications. You may have heard of the CGRP inhibitors, amyloid am just came out this year. This is, um, the CGRP is a little molecule involved in pain pathways. It's brand new, um, very expensive. Um, I have not seen um, a lot of patients on it yet, and probably because of the expense. Um, it's a medication that's injectable once a month to try to prevent and reduce headache frequency. It's for episodic or chronic migraine. The downside is that a lot of the clinical trials excluded vascular disease as one of their exclusion criteria. So I don't yet know if this is safe or that I would recommend it. It's typically not recommended first line anyway, but it's it's one that, that may, you know, in the next couple of years of, of being out on the market, we may learn more about its side effects. <coughs> Sometimes uh, patients have headaches that emanate from the cervical region, the neck, or from the posterior head region, and so sometimes trigger point injections or nerve blocks. And again, I, I often aim toward these kind of um, options for people that are either on, already on a lot of medications, can't tolerate the uh, oral medications, and um, are okay with the needles. The other device that's available, and this is just for migraine, it looks a little science fiction, it looks like some Star Trek um, thing. It's called a Sepoli device. It sits on your forehead. Um, it's like a TENS unit. If you've ever heard of a TENS unit that people put on their leg for leg pain that scrambles kind of the, the, the uh, pain sensation um, to the brain, it's, it, it acts by vibrating on the supraorbital nerves, which come right around the forehead. And you wear it 20 minutes a day every day, and it reduces the frequency of the headache. About half of people, uh, about 38% of people, will have a 50% reduction in migraine. It's not covered by insurance, it's between two and four hundred dollars depending on the style you get. But again, another non pill option for people that um, just don't want to be on the medications or can't tolerate them. Um, post surgical headaches um, also fall into that secondary and primary category. Um, secondary headaches sometimes you get spinal fluid weak, um, you may get bleeding or occasional hydrocephalus or incisional pain, and we again treat those depending on the cause. Now, primary headaches, when we look at post-surgical headaches, they can typically fall in one of the primary headache categories when you listen to the characterization of the headache. And so again, depending on the cause, we kind of aim at the treatment. Some of the things that I've mentioned for the neuralgia form pain and for the cervicogenic pain, and again, oftentimes um, injections or blocks uh, can be helpful. So I'm going to turn to women, and specifically the question is, do women face an increased aggressiveness having a pattern of malformation? Does female sex, just being female, does that increase the risk of aggressiveness from a pattern of malformation? And what about the rate of bleeding during pregnancy? Is that changed or is it the same? And what about um, estrogen's um, replacement or, or contraceptive use? And there's been a number of early studies suggesting maybe female sex um, was an increased risk of hemorrhage, but subsequently about three times the amount of papers have been published that suggest not. <coughs> and we looked at our database and we do not see that people um, are more likely to present with hemorrhage or develop a hemorrhage in the future just uh, between males and females, and it seems to be more equal. So I think we can say that there's some definitive evidence that, that just female sex increases the risk of bleeding. Early on in the 1980s and early 1990s literature, there was some suggestion that pregnancy increased the risk of aggressiveness. And it was a few case reports here and there. So a, a doctor sees a patient that has a, a bleed, and that the patient had a bleed during pregnancy, they're going to report it in the medical literature. And those 90 other patients that the, um, doctors saw that didn't have a bleed during pregnancy didn't seem so interesting. They didn't publish those. And so some of those early reports were probably overinflated. Subsequently, there's been a couple of studies suggesting that the pregnancy does not influence the aggressiveness. And I'll tell you a little bit about that because there's a little bit of an issue of how, how it was done. So both of the studies looked at women between 15 and 45 years of age. And 
of that child bearing age. And they said, how many bleeds happened during that time divided by how many years that is. And then if somebody had a couple of pregnancies, they would subtract those weeks from the time not pregnant and then calculate the number of bleeding events during that time pregnant. Now, some people, I don't know how many people were diagnosed 15 and younger, but a lot of people are diagnosed at 30, 40, sometimes 50. And so by measuring it this way, it assumes that the cavernous malformation was present during that entire time, which may not, which may be true for some people, but not everyone. So by doing a calculation like this, it underestimates the risk of bleeding. In any event, um, that was what was done, and um, Dr. Kalani, who just spoke, uh, published one of the papers, and suggested that the risk of bleeding during pregnancy was about 3.4%, slightly higher in the familial form, slightly lower in the sporadic form. And compared to the, what's known about um, bleeding risk, it was similar to bleeding risk in, in people that were not pregnant. A second study um, also suggested a low risk, both being pregnant and not pregnant, but the average age of diagnosis there was 42. So again, they assumed that the lesion had been there much longer, and so it makes the, the, um, the denominator bigger and the, the, the percent lower than maybe it could be. So we took a more pragmatic approach and said, if the patient was diagnosed at this point in time, let's look at this point in time to 45, and do a similar calculation, and we had about 1.8%. Um, 1, 1 so again, there's not convincing evidence that pregnancy or postpartum state increases the risk of aggressiveness, but the data is limited in the ways I've just mentioned, um, especially those for the familial form where maybe people get diagnosed at an earlier age. And um, so I think this is important to many people, and we still need to collect these big and large databases of patients and pull them together to see um, what the true long-term risk is after diagnosis, not kind of assuming that it was there before. So we look also at the use of estrogen um, in patients. And I looked in the medical literature, and there's like two case reports, and then some basic science patients papers, and nothing else. Um, and so this is very limited information as well. We looked at, in our database, we had, at the time I made this calculation, 117 women. The average age that they were diagnosed was 42. And again, about 20% familial, 80% uh, sporadic. And about 15% were on estrogen at the time they were medically diagnosed. And up to 62% had been on estrogen at some point in their past. Maybe they were on it from age uh, 20 to 30, and now they're diagnosed at 52, or um, they were not on it at the time of diagnosis. And we had uh, about 40% were accidentally found, incidental, and 40% had come to us because of bleeding. And that, uh, that's important, I'll show you in the next slide. So if we look at, does do women on current estrogen have a higher future risk of hemorrhage? And we actually found, yes, 44% um, of patients on estrogen had a new bleeding event compared to 17% of patients who had a new bleeding event were not on estrogen. And I put a question mark, there's small numbers. Um, so again, 17, 18 patients. And when you look at those eight patients that bled again, they had started with bleeding. So this was a second bleed, which makes me conclude that this data is probably most important for those who have had a recent bleed, not, it does not apply to everyone. And so it, it, the numbers are small, but it at least raise a concern. So I asked my expert opinions because I saw this data and I thought, oh gosh, what, what do we do with this data? And so I asked uh, my uh, colleagues and, and the, some of the Angel Alliance uh, clinicians, and 70% were okay with estrogen, but one caution against use, if they had a developmental venous anomaly, one caution against use, in people over 35. So there's a little bit of uncertainty at the end of what to do here. And for those that are not familiar with the developmental venous anomaly, it looks like this little witch's broom that kind of comes out of the cavernous malformation. So I, I think more detailed analysis of the people that were on estrogen and selecting more patients um, are, is going to be helpful. We're going to start to look at the types and doses of estrogen. 
and look out for progesterone containing medications. A lot of patients ask me about fertility meds, and there's no data on that either. So it's something that we're going to pursue, and I'm all, also happy to hear anecdotal information from people just gives me ideas. So I think further data is needed on the safety of estrogen, especially in um, sporadic form and those who have recently fled. Um, and one might consider an alternative for that um, in those select patients. A lot of patients as they age, maybe they need aspirin, or maybe they need COVID because they have a blood clot in their leg, and that becomes difficult because if cavernous malformations bleed and we're putting somebody on a blood thinner, that seems seems like it would be an obvious answer of what would happen. So do blood thinners cause bleeding in patients with cavernous malformation? And is the bleed risk higher? And there's been three studies published, 40 patients, 16 patients, 82 patients. And paradoxically, they all show a lower bleeding risk in the cavernous malformation. The lower bleeding it doesn't make any sense, does it, right? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Um, most of them were aspirin as opposed to warfarin or other blood thinners, but it, it um, was concerning. Um, so why is that? There's a couple of theories. Could this be, is this really true? Um, there's a theory with the sporadic form that the developmental venous anomaly that's associated with it might play a role in bleeding. I guess uh, we were talking to some folks last night. Some people believe in this theory, some people don't. Um, but it, that blood goes from the arteries to the capillaries to the veins. And that's how blood flows. And if you think about where a cavernous malformation is, it's kind of at the capillary level. And then sometimes um, it will drain into that developmental venous anomaly. So if you imagine some of the developmental venous anomalies are really, uh, the tree is very broad and some of them are narrow, and sometimes the, the vein actually narrows. And there's concern that maybe a clot could form in that tiny little vein, and then the blood couldn't get past that vein, and so it actually backs up and into the cavernous malformation, as maybe why they bleed. And so, if you use blood thinners in a sporadic form, maybe it would prevent clotting. Um, some people think, well, maybe it's the anti inflammatory effect of, of aspirin that helps because we know that inflammation may also play a role, although the dose of aspirin that usually gets the anti inflammatory is. With 1600 milligrams a day as opposed to the 81 milligrams a day if people want to take for heart disease. And it's very possible that it's statistical error. I mean, this is where we need to really sort through the data in larger numbers. Um, these are all retrospective studies um, where maybe a physician said, Boy, that person seems low risk, I'm going to use that blood thinner. Um, and so the people that had high risk weren't even included in such a study. And so I think there's a, there's a, there's again some question marks in this part of the data, but I think what's, what's reassuring is that the available data suggests that these people are, it doesn't cause people to bleed um, or precipitate bleeding. It's just that if you happen to bleed, maybe it would be worse. I have a number of patients that are um, have had life threatening clots in the lungs or the legs, and you have to weigh the risk and benefit in each patient. If they've not been symptomatic recently and they have a, a blood clot in the lung that's going to kill them, that might be somebody where the risk is worth it, whereas if somebody's um, recently had a hemorrhage, that's where it gets a little bit more concerning. And I think there's less data available in the familial form. A lot of those studies, the majority are the sporadic form. What about other medications? And should I take vitamin D? Does vitamin D reduce the risk of hemorrhage in patients with cavernous malformation? And some of you probably heard about the data, and I apologize to one of the folks that it's their study, which is I'm making it very simplified so I could understand it. Is they look at these cells that have the genetic defect for CCM2 under a microscope, and apparently they're a little funny looking where they're not, they're a little misshapen, the tight junctions are abnormal, and they can tell that the cells look abnormal. And then they literally have wells and wells of these cells with a bunch of half a dozen muffin pans with cells in them, and they, and this is where it, it's probably non-scientific, is they pour, pour some uh, repurposed medications on it. So 3,000 uh, 3, medications known on the market 
they put onto these wells. And two things seemed to restore the functional stability of the cells, and that was vitamin D and medication called Tempol, which you're going to hear about later today. So when I looked at the cells again, they looked better. So what's interesting about this vitamin D, so it was, it was not in humans, it was in cells and culture. And Dr. Awad did look at vitamin D levels in patients that had either multiple symptomatic hemorrhages or diagnosed at an early age and also saw that low vitamin D correlated with what he defined as chronic aggressiveness. <coughs> Um, this is data that we haven't published yet, we were just looking at the data, um, and it's basically showing um, y-axis vitamin D levels. So 30 to 50 is kind of considered as sufficient, less than 30 is kind of abnormal, and we did see a difference in um, about the patients presenting with hemorrhage had a lower vitamin D level than those that were presenting for other reasons, like seizure or um, incidental finding or other methyl issues. So we are also seeing that as well. Um, do we know if vitamin D reduces the future risk of hemorrhage? Not yet. We know that patients um, are more likely to present with hemorrhage in our data, but we're following them forward now. We don't have enough forward time to look at that. So we don't know yet. It's a pretty safe medication, and I, I think um, once they presented this, it was going to be hard to do a clinical trial because so many people knew about it that no one would want to be in the, the placebo arm. Mm -hmm. um, so sufficient is depends on which medical society you look at. Some say 20 to 40 nanograms per milliliter, some say 30 to 50. Um, and so that is sufficient for bone health. We don't know what is sufficient for cardiovascular health or other medical problems. So that is for bone health. Um, the recommended daily amount is 600 to 800 international units. And what I tell patients is to get your level checked. Because in our, in, in, at least in Minnesota, there's a lot of people that are actually deficient to the point where you need prescription level vitamin E to get up to normal. And then if you're in the normal range, probably six to 800 extra dozen doesn't hurt. We do know that people can get side effects from high vitamin D if you're kind of in the 60, 70, 80 type range. So it, you can overdo it. You can overdo it, but there's certainly, um, you know, whether you decide to take vitamin D3 supplement or whether you decide to drink a little extra milk or fortified orange juice or mackerel or whatever, your vitamin D is a choice that's about the milk that we would recommend. So I show patients this slide and it changes every time something new comes out. And again, what might be helpful or harmful for you might be different because I don't know what every individual situation. Um, but I put vitamin D is possibly helpful. Most of the data is kind of pushing in that direction. And we're probably not going to see a clinical trial. Unclear risks or benefits are the things that they're testing. Um, statins and propranolol, we're not sure if it's going to be helpful or harmful, but it's um, being tried. And again, I put the, the nonsteroidals and the blood thinners there that we're, we're not sure. We don't see anything bad coming out of them, but enough to see that they're, they're uh, positive either. We definitely haven't seen anything harmful about trichans. SSRIs are a certain type of antidepressant which can cause GI bleeding, so it's bleeding in the, uh, the gut. Um, we haven't seen any any uh, increased risk of bleeding with cavernous malformations. Results also with their vitamin D, which at high levels can also cause bleeding. We haven't seen anything there either. So I put them in neither helpful nor harmful. And then again, uh, the estrogen is, is, is just new. We were just looking at this data in the last three or four weeks. Um, so we just stay tuned that we're going to hone in on which those patients are, the doses they were on, and duration that they were on. So I get asked this a lot too. Can I run? Can I bike? Can I? There's some odd things people. <laughs> some odd things people do that I just can't. Like some guy climbs silos and falls down, and I don't know. There's some things I just don't know. But should you restrict people um, from physical activity? And this is a this is a very debated topic too. But so we ask patients about a number of physical activity type things. Um, and I'll show them shortly, but we compared those that did it 
moderate um, to frequent, so three times a month or more, those that did it rarely or not at all. And then we looked at is their bleed, was their bleed risk higher or lower? And we didn't see anything that seemed to increase the risk of future bleeding. Our numbers were small with altitude and scuba diving, um, but for aerobic activity, lifting weights less than 20 pounds, lifting weights greater than 20 pounds, contact sports, we didn't see any difference. Everyone's different, um, and the way somebody's bleeding comes on may be different than others. So, uh, again, it's all up to you and your um, discussion with your physician. I asked our expert poll, most people are definitely okay with the aerobic activity, biking, swimming, hiking. Uh, most people are okay with weights less than 20 pounds. <coughs> then it got concerning with heavier weights, contact sports. There were less, less of my experts that thought that was a good idea. Um, some of them said definitely not anything to the extreme. Um, and then nobody was comfortable making any statements really about altitude and scuba diving. Um, so I apologize. Um, so it's pretty flat, so um, not a lot of folks are out more than we go on to. So I'm going to end on outcomes, and I really want your opinion on this as well. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about how, how we physicians and clinicians and researchers look at things, and I'd like your opinion on how you look at things. Patients want to know what's going to happen. Am I going to be okay? Well, what's my 10-year outlook look like? What's my five-year outlook look like? And that's the most concerning um, thing for people. A lot of studies look at time of diagnosis to do people bleeding. How many people in here know someone with a second hemorrhage? So none of this data applies to you. Already you're wondering, what does the rest of my life look like if this data usually um, you censor or stop following that person if they have a new lead surgery or um, who's to follow up. So it's a good um, tool for looking at, at first leads, but um, not every lead is equally disabling. And then if you've already had a second grade lead, what is the rest of my life? There's a long time where um, we're not sure. So then when we look at functional outcome, so take the same patient had diagnosis, and then how well am I running, jumping, working, um, doing the things I like to do? And there's something called a modified ranking score, and it's used very commonly in, in the stroke world as an outcome. And you can see the different categories where zero to two is considered good outcome. Often it means you're functionally independent. You can bathe yourself, dress yourself, um, make yourself dinner, um, whereas three, three and four are more moderately disabled, and five is um, a bed bound. And we've looked at some of that data, and what I have here is um, on this axis is surviving independently, so modified Rankin of zero to two. And 100% means 100% of those people are functioning independently. And then as you look over time, the, the bars fall because some people have reached that number three level. And I have um, the, group, the red group is incidental, they were diagnosed just as an accidental finding, the blue group is presenting with seizures, and the, the green is presenting with a hemorrhage. Um, and so, that's yours. So what you see is a patient that initially presents with hemorrhage at five years, 80% are still functioning independently. 20% have reached that three. And this is everyone. This is not no matter if you had surgery or not surgery. And so some of those little declines might be the people with the second or third bleed um, as it goes down. Whereas people that presented with seizure or an incidental finding were relatively doing uh, quite well over that five years. Now I say relatively because people with seizures know that, okay, I can walk and talk and do my usual things on most days, but if I have four seizures a year, I can't drive, and that limits what I can do. So this this type of functional scale is good for disorders which have a decline, it's a steady decline, but it's not good for episodic disorders. Um, it's not good for uh, measuring, maybe I also have multiple sclerosis, or I also have, I broke my leg this week, um, you can see the functional outcome go down. So it has its limitations. 
doesn't measure how you're feeling and how the disease emotionally impacts you. I don't go out in public because I don't want people to see that something's wrong with me. Um, so it doesn't measure those things. So then we talk about quality of life. Um, sorry, where you look at the person and you measure their quality of life and what, what does that mean? It means how are they doing in all the domains of life? Are they working? Are they physically functioning, socially and emotionally functioning? Um, you know, looking at every aspect of life. And there's a whole bunch of these quality of life measures. Some are five question things. Are you doing in the last seven days? Are you depressed? Are you are you doing your work? And they're very general. So if I have a bad day at work, maybe I'm down that day, and it's it's not specific because of a cavernous malformation or a medical problem, it's just I had a bad day at work. Um, whereas disease specific means it's very specific to the symptoms your disease would encounter so that you can measure the drop-offs and, and say that they're truly secondary to the cavernous malformation and not something else going on in life. And so these have become more um, popular to add on to clinical trials because it will give us more data, not just did the medication work or not work in terms of preventing bleeds, but does it does the medication improve quality of life? We do have an ongoing brain center quality of life project because the brain site is unique in terms of the symptoms people experience. Um, we are specifically looking um, to, to have patients in, enroll in our study. We have over 100 now, and it's a lot of questions. I apologize for those who have done it. It's 147 questions, but what we're trying to do is look at three different quality of life measures and see which one kind of um, assesses our goal the best. So you can email us if you're interested. We have that open until February 2019. And I'm definitely interested in any other thoughts you have um, about outcome measures that are important to you and your family that we can start as a community to further look at in a scientific way and make sure that, that your questions are answered. Um, I acknowledge my Mayo team, Dr. Lanzino is my uh, neurosurgery partner and, and um, uh, big advocate of patients. I think uh, Connie and Amy for making this possible for me to meet other clinicians, researchers, um, basic science people that I, I don't get to talk to um, and to share ideas and, and collaborate. And especially, I think the patients that have been involved in any of the studies that I've participated in and all of you were considering some of those studies because um, you can't get this done without the collaboration that they mentioned this morning. So thank you. And Happy to answer questions or I just want to mention that I had a brain stem bleed and had surgery. I did not have headaches. I had vertigo. I had extreme vertigo, flying into the sky, flying through walls, back and forth, um, almost falling down the stairs. Um, yeah, there's that vertigo is a hard one to treat, um, especially in the acute period. Um, so there are medications we can do to suppress that, but but in, in this causing severe symptoms, like people are actually vomiting and, and difficult to suppress the symptoms in the long term, it's good to not suppress those and to undergo vestibular therapy. Right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's a hard one, it's a very hard one to treat. Um, benzodiazepines like and it's kind of medications help, but yeah, obviously we don't like those on a daily basis. Um, I take them daily. Yeah. That was a very hard one. And I did that surgery. Yeah, sometimes, and sometimes surgery, sometimes depending on how much mass effects or pressure on certain structures of the brain, sometimes you get rid of that vertical, but sometimes it's the pathways they go in that they disrupt the fibers that that help us with balancing our eyes and our legs and things like that. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to do that. Uh, other concerns or questions? Let's stand in our future study. Will there be a separation of one versus hundred lesions or any back treatment? I'm curious if, if, if that can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I'm curious too. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea because there, there's theoretical reasons why the, the sporadic form, the developmental venous anomaly, plays a role 
when you when you actually look at the sporadic form, even regular MRI, green Tesla, um, 20 to 30 percent of people have a development of these anomalies. When you do seven Tesla MRI, everybody is sporadic form. And we, we just got a 17, so it's, it's very exciting. Uh -huh. You see this amazing tree. I should have brought a picture, but stuff you can't see on the regular MRI, you see this amazing tree of these EVAs are very complex. And so one of our next steps is looking at sort of that Venus architecture, which we've never been able to visualize before, um, and see if there's a difference in the Venus architecture of those that are symptomatic versus asymptomatic. But, Good idea. I'm gonna write it down. Yes. Um, I do. I was in touch with you on the quality of life thing. Um, it's uh, my daughter is the one that's affected, um, and she has CCM3 and a pretty aggressive form of that. So my question is, I think when we, when you and I actually exchanged emails, she was at a, a much different place but in terms of looking at the quality of life for her life as compared to the norm you know i was thinking about it as i was looking at your screen you know her quality of life is um something that many people would fear you know and she's had multiple craniotomies and multiple brain surgeries um but for her there's a beauty to it you know she can't read or write but and she's 22 she won't live independently um she, um, but we've kind of helped her to, to find a quality of life that works. Um, so my question is sometimes I think in the um, developing these, um, there's the clinical need and then there's the, the need to present hope to people who may be disabled by these things, but to realize that your life doesn't end there. There could be a richness to the life that uh, is different. I completely agree with you. And that's absolutely true. Like, um, a number of our patients develop new interests and new, new life that was not something they would have that they would have taken. Right. But it's an interesting new path for them that, that does give them hope and gives them participation in life that, that makes it important and feel connected. So I think that's a, that's a very good Share, oh, I'll share a little bit of my kind of a personal one, but everyone is a patient physician here. But since you brought it up, but my so in 2008 was when I first started having these, and they were um, uh, small, very small, and and so I guess it's actually significant as much as they were. So I had I had three like that, and then in 2014, um, um, I started to take IVF drugs. And, um, and and trying to get pregnant, and then it was and it was following my whole period of taking the, the drugs that I had a very big leap, and so I was I was really surprised because when I had the three smaller ones, um, the neurosurgeons or the neurologists were said you know just leave it alone, and and that's how I was just sort of used to living my life, just feeling bad for a couple of days, <coughs> then completely back to normal. And then when I had the one in 2014 after IVF drug, they said you need surgery, and I thought no, 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 I don't, I, I don't. But anyway, I did, and so it, and then that big one bled again in the same spot, um, and, and even more. So I, I feel and intuitively feel that it was um, the, the IVF drug mm -hmm. that caused me to have a bigger bleed. I mean, obviously I was prone to bleeding. In the past, but that made it at least four times, five times larger than any of my previous weeks. Yeah, it's very interesting. I've had a number of other people with similar stories, and so that's why I kind of go back and like survey the same women that have been in our study for a while and, and ask them those questions too, because we had just collected data on estrogen, but not the other hormone you know, mm -hmm. medications. So and then I then I and I wonder if other women feel this way too, but it also it does also I feel more symptomatic even you know now once a month I'm like more symptomatic. So it's a, so I feel like um, that causes more symptoms and barometric pressure in the weather. Well, barometric pressure is a good one. Yeah, that, that one a lot of people tell oh, yeah. me there's some sort of come back and 
symptoms. Okay. And not necessarily severe, but enough to be symptomatic and feel all the crap for a few days. Yeah. I've heard that from multiple. Everyone's shaking their head. That's yeah. the moment. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think you had. I was going to ask what the roles then um, I think it's really in its infancy. There's some trials uh, in hemorrhage from <coughs> non cavernous malformation, like hypertensive type hemorrhage or amyloid type hemorrhage. And there's a few very beginning stem cell things for skin exposure, but nothing that I don't in cavernous malformation is. So um, I have a couple of spinal cord. Um, You got a new MRI machine that yeah. has more pixels. So uh, I have had this my first drug in 2004 and have had four really significant bleeding episodes since then, three different strokes. Um, and things never show up, even on MRI as well. And so an MRI is not an MRI in the future. Are you? Hopeful that there'll be better imaging, and how do we know if you go to our local health clinic and get an MRI? Is it accurate? That's a that's a very good question. That happens right. all the time that people mm -hmm. have symptoms. We go and image them, and the symptoms relate to that location in the brain. There's no doubt, but the, the MRI doesn't show anything obvious. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, maybe these little micro bleeds we can't see, or um, maybe there's some swelling. But we don't know. Um, the seven tests are. Tesla units is the way they measure the magnetism, mm -hmm. how strong the magnet is. And so it's giving us a lot prettier pictures on um, uh, what's called the susceptibility weighted mm -hmm. SWI. We get very pretty pictures of the veins. And it doesn't look to me any better for looking for hemorrhage, but I, I think your question is a good one. Now, Dr. Selman, the talk this morning, he's called those focal neurologic deficits and counts them in natural history studies that even though Boy, the imaging doesn't show it. We're going to count that as an event, um, but nobody knows what to do with them at the time. The one thing that I heard yesterday that was very hopeful and kind of interesting is, and I don't know how many experienced that, like with a hypertensive hemorrhage, if somebody has a brain hemorrhage because of hypertension, they reach their maximal worst point within hours. With cavernous malformation, we've seen about 80% of people sort of get worse over a one to 10 day period before they get to peak. Yesterday, we were talking about some medications that might be interesting. We talk about medications to prevent a hemorrhage, but if you're having symptoms for something that takes two days, three days, five days, then the symptoms go away faster so you don't reach that people. So, I heard some really interesting talks yesterday and hopeful that those little flips in the road that are kind of annoying. Something you can't go to work that day or you can't function that day. Is there something we can do to knock those down? I don't. But hopefully there's other imaging studies that will come, come about, but I don't know um, that we're going to discover those in the next five years, but, but the 70 is interesting for definitely me. And to, to um, um, somebody asked Dr. Kalani about CAT scans, I've seen so many people who diagnosed on CAT scans. Um, MRI is the only way to diagnose a hemorrhage and a small patient from that day. And MRI has to have that SWI? Doesn't, that, that's only good. Look for the subtle little ones. So, mm -hmm. if, you have the, if you're looking for the familial form or want to count the number of lesions, SWI is not so important for looking for hemorrhage. It's, it's the standard so they call T1 and T2 sequences that are important for diagnosing hemorrhage. And you don't need yet to diagnose hemorrhage either. You don't need to have. That's funny though. Yeah, sorry, you go ahead. It's okay. Yeah. Um, thank you guys for your question. We'll have time at lunch, uh, breakout groups that you know, answer or ask questions about splamine or something. Yeah, sir. I got shared. Uh, I spoke earlier this morning, so um, 